this works so smoothly in rehearsals. <laughs> anyway, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the IEA Clean Coal Centre, I feel privileged to be here in India again to uh, take part in the Petra Coal Conference, of which I've been a fairly regular attendee over the last five or so years. I'm going to talk about high efficiency, low emissions coal power technologies. And I've set out here how I intend to approach that. What so I'm going to start with, for many of you will not know much about the IEA Clean Coal Centre, so I'm going to say a bit about who we are, what we do, and indeed why we do it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the energy trilemma, because that's very important when one's considering um, the issues associated with coal. I'm then going to talk about the power technologies itself, a few words about global power trends, um, and then a bit about ongoing developments, particularly in relation to improving the overall in performance in terms of higher efficiencies, lower environmental impact. And then I'm also going to say a little bit about operational flexibility, because with the increasing levels of intermittent renewables on most grids around the world, there's a need to uh, introduce uh, something to balance those grids, and that task has fallen to coal-fired plants, which are actually doing a very good job at it. And then a few words about where we might go from here. Okay, who are we? Well, we're part of a network of autonomous collaborative partnerships. We're a, what's known as a technology collaborative program. And we're organized under the auspices of the International Energy Agency, but we're functionally and legally autonomous. That gets the legal bit out of the way. That's something a bit more interesting. Um, we're basically a, a subscription organization. We're, we're funded by a mixture of national governments and corporate industrial organizations who, by supporting us in that way, help us to define the work program with, with, which they particularly want to see, and also help to guide us and, uh, and provide uh, external um, you know, evaluation of the, the work we're doing so we can you know, revi revise regularly the strategic approach to make sure it fits with the needs at that time. Bottom line is we're de dedicated to providing independent information and analysis on whole, how coal can become a cleaner source of energy and compatible with the UN sustainability goals. I've listed here the seven, sorry, uh, eight um, goals that are uh, most applicable to coal utilization. Uh, there are 17 in total, but only eight are particularly appropriate to, to coal. And within our program, we identify and publicize the best practice in every aspect of coal production, utilization, transport, processing, ut and um, utilization chain with the, within the rationale for balancing security of supply, affordability, and environmental issues. We look at policy and regulatory issues. Everything's policy driven at the end of the day as well as looking at technical things such as efficiency gains, lowering greenhouse and non-greenhouse gas emissions. We're increasingly doing a lot of work on how you might reduce the water stress. We heard a bit about this sort of thing yesterday, and it's becoming increasingly important worldwide. We also look at market issues, financial resourcing, and all aspects of technology development, and most importantly, deployment. We're also looking at poverty alleviation through, un through universal access to robust and reliable el electricity, um, which again is a, is a very important issue. We've heard a little about the energy trilemma, and here is, here is a simple representation of that. Um, it's the basis, essentially, for every rational energy strategy in the world. Um, if you're a government or a region that's trying to set up its, uh, how it's gonna, what energy it's going to use and how it's going to use it, security of energy supply is paramount, or I would suggest it's paramount. Uh, getting that energy at an affordable cost is uh, very, very important. 
and dealing with environmental issues, which of course these days includes climate, climate protection um, regarding cl carbon, carbon emissions. I think the most important thing to stress here is that the, that, that triangle effectively represents an energy compromise. It's not sustainable to focus on one aspect without consideration of the others. So if you think about my previous slide where I was talking about sustainability, you can, you can look at and you must look at uh, climate issues, uh, carbon emissions and so on, but you've got to make sure that you're dealing with everything in a sustainable approach and uh, that's not quite as easy as it sometimes seems. Just a couple of facts and figures. Coal currently provides 41% of global electricity and it's an essential raw material for the production of 70% of the world's steel and about 90% of cement. There are ways being developed, perhaps we can deal with that, that with less coal, uh, but that, that's still very much a work in progress. So whatever the views are worldwide, I think coal is going to remain a significant and integral part of the global energy mix for well into the future. Uh, we can talk about how long that future might be, but I think the point is it's here, it's going to be used, so let's use it as cleanly and efficiently as possible. The other key point that I want to make at the early part of my presentation, the globe, the world, is not a homogenous place. Maybe that's self-evident, but it is not a homogenous place. Different regions are at different stages of technological and economic development. Different regions have different energy options available to them and, and various other issues that have to be addressed. So I think it's fair to say that different parts of the world have different priorities for ensuring a sustainable future. And those priorities may well change in time. We've, we heard earlier about the, the massive growth in renewables in certain parts of the world, for example. A few words on that um, in terms of how different regions are um, performing in different ways. The USA, it wasn't that long ago, the USA was uh, a nervous international player considerably concerned about uh, security of energy supply. It was very dependent on imported oil and gas. As they say in the States, it's now blessed with uh, shale gas and shale oil. Really blessed. They got unbelievably cheap gas, for example. Because they've got that, that's re resulted in a major change in their energy trial ever. So they're now using those materials because they're achieving a lot with those. But at the same time, they're now becoming a, an exporter of oil. So uh, with the fact that they have so much gas, they're closing a lot of their old coal power stations. And unlike Asia, which we'll get onto shortly, the stations in the States are really old. Um, they're getting major efficiency gains in that way. And they're also at the forefront of the demonstration of carbon capture, utilization, and storage, which we'll come back to a bit later, as I think that's going to have a major part to play in some parts of the world. So, you know, the US has turned itself around. Uh, and actually, you know, though it's making, uh, well, it's more than making bellicose noises, it's going to withdraw from the climate agreements, the uh, Paris Agreement. You actually look at what's been achieved in the States compared to what's been achieved elsewhere, for maybe not for the reasons you'd expect, but it's made bigger savings in terms of carbon emissions than any other part of the world. Uh, I'm about to say I come from Europe. Unfortunately, I don't come from Europe anymore. I'm now part of the UK and we're separate. But Europe has strong targets for achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. There's a policy-driven program to close coal plants, irrespective of how old they are, whether they're worn, worn out or not. And most of them aren't. They're mostly quite new. Um, they're also then introducing very, very significant levels of intermittent renewable power. Um, and that's been driven by the European Commission. And the member states within the European Union are following the diktats from the Commission in terms of what's going to be achieved and by when. I think it's fair to say at the moment uh, the impact of knocking the coal plants out very early and introducing increasingly large amounts of uh, renewable, intermittent renewable energy 
I don't think the impact's yet clear, but it's known it's quite clear what they want to achieve. Um, but if we look on a bit further, Middle East, oil and gas. Well, actually, the coal power is increasingly being included in the energy portfolio. One of our members, for example, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, is currently building a two gigawatt coal-fired plant alongside a desalination unit, and there's many others of those being established. And you've got a number of other major coal plants being achieved in uh, northern, northern Africa, in the Middle East region. Africa itself is it pushing to introduce both advanced coal and renewable power. Uh, and obviously, in both cases, uh, there's a number of different drivers. But clearly, their coal, coal plans at least, are particularly significant. In Asia, there's been considerable introduction of renewables. Uh, but the focus present remains with coal power. And there's particularly um, strong financial support for introducing coal power coming from China and Japan. We heard a little bit about Japan yesterday on, on that topic. There's also a lot of exciting energy and technology advancements, which include some major CCS initiatives. I should just make the point here. Um, I'm, I'm rushed going through this stuff very quickly because of limitations on time. All the studies that we do, all the work that we do, we consider very, very important. So do other people. And it's so important, we'll give all of it to you for free. So if you're interested in any of our reports, go on our website, register. You can then go to the reports that we've got and you can download them for free. If you have any problems doing it that way, get in touch with me and I'll, I'll make sure you, you get what you need. So it's all available to you, it's all out there. And on that point, also because I can't cover everything in the presentation, I've added on at the back end of my presentation a, a pack of other slides which again can be made available to you. I presume that the organisers are going to put these web presentations up on the website, but if they don't, again I can get that information to you. In relation to what I just said on the regional activities, the, Coal power has moved extensively, very uh, considerably in terms of improving its efficiency, improving its environmental performance. And we have the so-called high efficiency, low emission coal power systems. Essentially what we're saying here is um, the more efficient the process, the less coal you have to burn for units of output, whether it's, uh, in this case, electricity. And we have state-of-the-art technology that can reduce the SOX, NOx particulate matter and mercury to well below the toughest standards in the world for this, which happens to be in, in China at present. And then in due course, carbon capture utilization and storage, or carbon capture and storage, can be added on uh, as, a, as another downpipe uh, technology at the end of the process. This slide shows a uh, a graph which is indicating the efficiency of the process on the horizontal axis and the, the typical carbon emissions or CO2 emissions that you would get from these particular processes. The oldest one, the sort of, yes, it's the orangey brown on the left is um, essentially the so called subcritical plants, which relates to the subcritical relates to the steam temperatures and pressures that are being used. They were around for uh, forever. A lot of them are now uh, very, very old, uh, finding it more difficult to be maintained and increasingly are being replaced and removed from the, from the grid systems. Over the last 20 years, we've seen major advancements in increasing the steam temperatures and pressures, first to achieve supercritical additions, and then more recently over the last 10 years, ultra supercritical and that program has again been driven forward by both China and Japan, both for domestic use and also for export possibilities. And you can see as you go up into the ultra supercritical range, you're getting a very considerable drop in uh, CO2 emissions compared to what you would have been getting with the subcritical units. And just at the end of that slide, there's a sort of vermilion color. Um, that uh, is really referring to what's going on in the development world at the moment in terms of taking the technology to advance ultra supercritical. 
Uh, I made mentions about emissions control. I'm not going to consider this slide any detail. It's just to say, they've got, if you put a state-of-the-art emissions system on, you can achieve every global uh, emission standard necessary for coal-fired plants in terms of air, air quality and emissions control. Um, what I'm talking about here is just giving you an example of the capacity. This is for the ultra supercritical systems, which are really the state of the art at the moment, just for those, nothing else. And you can see there's round about uh, 250 gigawatts of capacity worldwide with about 90% of that in Asia, a lot, lot, lot of it in China. And there's a certain amount in Europe, though the stuff in Europe is going to be closed over the next 10 years or so if the EU programmer uh, is carried through. But there's a lot, and there's a lot more than just what's in place at the moment. This slide shows that globally the coal power fleet is about 2,000 gigawatts, 700 gigawatts of which have been installed since 2010. There's about a further 150 gig gigawatts of new capacity that's being built in 32 countries within Africa, Middle East, and, and Asia. Of that, 80, point, 80 gigawatts is ultra supercritical. Uh, 53, 54 gigawatts is slightly less uh, advanced. And then there's just a few, very few, um, subcritical, the old fashioned units still being built. There's also 274 gigawatts in the planning stage across 60 countries, 75% of that in Asia. And just again to put that in context, you probably all know this, but many people in the, the West don't. You look at a picture of the globe and you sort of put a light over Asia, it fills a you know, not insignificant part, but it's nothing like 50% of the globe and more, much more than 50% of the world's population live in Asia. It's a young population, it's growing industrialization with growing energy needs. So there's a lot of challenges there and um, we heard a bit about that a, a bit earlier this morning, at least for India. So what about other, oh for God's sake, more hasteless speed. Um, Let's talk a little bit about, I'll talk a little bit about the development work that's going on at present. Um, there's been five programs worldwide looking at pushing the steam temperatures and pressures still further so that you can get 50% cycle efficiency. We're up to about 47, 48 now. And actually if you took those plants and, and you could actually get them past 50% if you put the, this new systems that are being proven. When you get up to those sort of temperatures and pressures, the traditional steels that have been used on the earlier plants are no longer appropriate because of, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't stand the conditions. So there's been, a major, there's been major programs um, developing and then testing and getting standards approved for new materials, which are now at the, the point where demonstration plants could be built. So some of these programs have been running for 20 years. That's not to say they've been sort of ticking along. There's been major development of the materials and then long-term long trials to see how those materials perform. It would appear, of all those five, and talking to the National Thermal Power Corporation and others, that the, a demonstration of the Indian concept for this is likely to happen by 2025, and there's uh, preparatory work underway. So again, um, we heard about the NTPC's commitment to renewable energy, that's fine. There's also a commitment at present to taking forward this technology through demonstration and presumably to deployment. If you're an engineer and like fancy things, this is a piece of work that's been, well not a piece of work, a plant that's being built in China, in Pingshan and, and Wei province. Uh, this has a double reheat ultra supercritical turbine that gives you a lot of improved efficiencies. But the, the smart thing about this though is taking, um, taking the steam turbine, instead of having it, a, you know, the boiler on the plant it exits at the top and then traditionally you have a long pipe all the way down 
to ground level where you put the steam turbine. Well, when you're dealing with sort of a you know right state of the art material uh, temperatures and pressures, that's going to be a very long and very expensive piece of steel work, and you're going to lot efficiency losses because you're going to lose a lot of heat going down that pipe. Whatever whatever you do to prevent that, they had the idea of well, okay, we'll put the steam or most of the steam turbine right at the top of the boiler. Now they've had strong support from the Chinese government and from industry. They're actually well in. They've completed the design work, that's all been signed off, and they're now in the process of starting to build this. And I should point out there, um, they work very closely with uh, Siemens on the steam turbine side of things and General Electric on the boiler, so there's, there's international cooperation into that project. But if that works, that's going to get over 50%. So coal power plants are not just sort of moving forward, there's a lot of interesting, innovative work going forward to continue to drive, drive those uh, efficiencies upwards. The other thing, though, that, of course, has impacted on coal power plants is that when you, those coal plants, as ever, are used in a grid system, with the increasing introduction of intermittent materials, uh, no signs of... Um, storage that's going to meet the full needs of a grid system. There's been a need for another way of stabilizing the grid, which is a, a low a duty that's been borne by the coal-fired plants, and I'll say a little bit about that. Term, so, as well as uh, you know, meeting the environmental standards, they're also having to now operate flexibility to reflect the intermittency that you get from introducing renewables onto a grid system. Um, that flexible operation can hit all areas of the plant in terms of um, how, it, how it's going to behave, how long the components will last and so on. Uh, and it's certainly clear that optimising the instrumentation and control has to be really a, a precondition of any other measures. So if you get that right, you're a long way forward. But there's a lot of work been going on, both from a retrofit point of view, and the outcome of that, where it's successful, has been written into the design codes for new plants as well. Just to give you an example of that, this is uh, some information from Germany. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got um, look, you've got showing the power demand that's been required in Germany. Um, and you can see that the convention, the yellow and the green and yellow reflects the uh, wind and solar respectively, and it's you know it's intermittent, and it changes very quickly. Um, and you've then got to be able to balance that off. And initially, with a great bulk of um, conventional coal-fired plant, that was that was achievable. Germany then decided to make it a bit more complicated for themselves, so they've stopped using nuclear power, which takes out the base load. You know, if you're going to look it around, you may as well have a good go at it. Uh, and that's showing what's happening in a week um, projected for a week in May 2020. Um, um, and you can see that it was projected, and in fact it has happened, that you've got much more uh, flexibility being brought into play, no nuclear base load, uh, and so the, the coal-fired plants are having to behave ever more rapid, react ever more quickly to, to balance the grids out. Instrumentation and control, a key approach, as I said, I'm not going to go into this in any detail in the interest of time. Um, other thing that you require is be able to run at very low minimal load, because there'll be times, as I showed in that pre uh, earlier slide, you pretty well almost didn't want any coal-fired plant because it was all renewables. But the next minute, you'd need to be able to bring the things back up on load. Um, so there's been a lot of work done in adjusting the fineness of the coal, the mills, and so on, so that the Camry respond very quickly, and they've got stable combustion down to a level of 15% of the uh, the maximum load and in a carefully a carefully demonstrated study they actually got it down to 10% on the um, 
Arbron Power Station, which I've just put in the picture there for, for reference. So a lot of achievements there. That's then led on to other ways of dealing with low minimal load, changing the designs of the evaporators in the boilers and some of the other components, all of which is interesting engineering work uh, um, that's all been taken forward successfully. And there's um, what you're trying to avoid, again, is you don't want to be starting up the plant very often. Now, if you keep it at low load rather than having to start up, you, you avoid the complexities of that, you avoid a lot of expense, and you li limit damage to your components that, that are in the, in the boiler. And having kept it, the start-up, you're getting to very low load. There's also been a lot of work so that you can ramp the boilers up very much quicker than used to be the case. So that's a sort of fairly unsung uh, story uh, in many parts of the world, but it's, it's been achieved uh, partic and particularly used in Europe where we've had a very massive introduction of renewables. There's also a lot of work going forward on improving flexibility through plant management. Um, you've got three choices. You can have a reactive approach, which is more or less close your eyes, cross your fingers and run the plant until it breaks. And that's really not to be recommended. Or you can have the predict preventative approach where you have, a, you have regular maintenance periods where you check what's going on. But increasingly there's uh, technologies and techniques being developed that will allow you to predict the behaviour and the condition. It's based on a digital approach and that looks like it's, it's confidence that that approach is going to have meaningful value to the operators of the plants in the well, foreseeable future. Okay, where might we go from here? Carbon capture and storage. I'm waiting for the rumble that people say, well, what are we talking about that for? It doesn't work. Um, if we're looking to transform transfer a transition to a least cost and reliable net zero electricity zero system, we can go the renewables route if that is what people want to do. Um, but equally, if you're a coal-based economy and you've got uh, either the coal as a domestic source or you've got very uh, strong faith that you can continue to import it, you could go the continue the coal route and introduce carbon capture and storage so you can take the CO2 out and either turn it into other products which is the utilization route or store it um, safely in underground geological formations uh, where there's a lot of work being done to show that that's, that's a viable and uh, acceptable approach. Again like I said at the beginning there's no one-size-fits-all solution to any of these problems so the approach of CCS is going to be perhaps more appropriate in certain parts of the world than others. Um, and indeed, up, but uh, you've also got to take into account that like other technologies that I've been talking about, CCS has been improving. All the components have been tested at commercial scale successfully. Uh, the Petronova plant in the States uh, 540 megawatt plant, 270 megawatts of which go through the carbon capture process. Um, that's worked basically since day one without any major problems at all. The biggest problem is getting the power company and the oil company to work together, but that's a different, different subject. Um, you can get more than 90% CO2 capture, and that may, you know, we can get up to about 95, 97% now. May not sound a big thing. But it does, it helps to bring the cost down by enormous where the curve's starting to flatten out. And that improves the capacity factor significantly. So it, in, certainly, so if you're, you, know, you, can, you can deploy it on a power plant that's operating alongside renewables, so you can, you can maintain a mix of technologies if that's the way to go feel people want to go forward, and that will work. There's a lot of studies going on around the world looking at um, net zero carbon power systems. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Andrew, you need to con conclude now. I've got three slides. We will be in for some sort of time. Okay. okay. Please conclude. Yeah, I'll finish very quickly. Um, there's a lot of work going on looking at net zero carbon power systems. 
been done in different parts of the world. And, and on a total system cost basis, they can look financially very attractive. I haven't spoken about these, and I'm not going to, but there's a lot of other things. Your trans, uh, transformations are not just limited to the power plant. There's a lot of other stuff, again, that's been talked about already in the conference. And I just want to finish on this, or this on the next slide. This is work that's been put forward by uh, Mr. Scott Foster, who's the director of the Sustainable Energy Division of the UN. And he's pointed out uh, very thoroughly the international policy debates are driven by OECD countries and organizations, fine, but the people which it's going to affect most are the developing countries because they have the bigger energy demands like, Euro, uh, like uh, Asia in particular. And they are, their needs are driven by the UN sustainability ag agenda, which I put up at the start. So you've got the OECD countries saying, we need this to be done. Developing countries saying, well, that's just one of our priorities, not all of them. So there's a, there's a lot of debate and need for accommodation for that. And what we don't yet have anywhere in the world is an energy strategy that will provide a realistic way of achieving the one and a half degree target while addressing the key issues that developing countries need to focus on. Thank you very much for listening.